giant, rotating, glow-in-the-dark LED gear cube has been the source of a bit of controversy for me. I uploaded a YouTube short about it recently and had many people praise its success, ponder its existence, or criticize its questionable build quality. I don't blame the naysayers. The quality is lacking, but there's a reason for that. And once I'm done explaining how this cube came about and why it's less than perfect, I'll have either won over my adversaries or, the more likely scenario, be even more harshly criticized, because I made some questionable decisions when it came to building this. For anyone just seeing this cube for the first time and don't know what it is, the short rundown is that this gear cube is a model that is very difficult to print on FDM and resin style printers, which are the two most common printers that you're going to see in houses that have 3D printers. There was a challenge going around on the 3D print talk side of TikTok. To participate, you had to print the cube in one piece and it still had to rotate. Well, I did that, and my next thought was, let's print it really big in glow-in-the-dark filament and cram a bunch of LEDs into it. I got the idea because I did something similar with this Lapras model that now sits as a desk lamp next to me. Or as some of my clever TikTok followers have coined it, Lampras. As a desk lamp, in order for her LEDs to stay lit, Lampras needs to be plugged in at all times. But I wanted to be able to rotate the cube whilst the LEDs were lit, which gave me the added complications of using batteries and finding a way to charge them. I wanted to use some 14500 lithium ion battery cells that I had on hand, but they were too big for the cube, so I had to settle on finding some much smaller lithium polymer batteries instead. I found a boost converter charge circuit combo that allowed me to convert the 3.7 volts of the batteries to the 5 volts that the LEDs needed to operate, plus the batteries would charge. And speaking of charging, I decided to also use wireless charging because the act of getting the micro USB of the charge circuit externally accessible to the cube seemed like an executional nightmare. Plus, wireless charging is cool. And then of course, to keep with the spirit of the TikTok challenge, I decided to print the cube all in one piece. Plus, I liked the idea of permanently embedding the electronics into the print. It makes it feel more organic to me and kind of more like a work of art. The print was scaled up to 410% of its original size, which was enough to fill pretty much the entire build plate on my Ender 3 Pro. Crammed into each gear is a strand of LEDs, a battery, a boost converter and charge circuit combo, and a wireless receiver. Okay, so one of the wireless receivers actually broke, and I had to convert that particular gear over to using the micro USB on the charge circuit. And in total, there's about 25 feet of LEDs crammed into the cube. The total time to print the cube, as reported by my slicer, came out to just over three days. But it really took closer to three weeks. Yeah, that's where stuff gets questionable. But more on that in a minute, because I need to go over print quality. You may have noticed that there is a lot of layer shifting going on in this print. That's because the act of embedding the LEDs required that I pause the print several times, once to actually cram all the stuff in there, and then several more pauses to continue to thread the strands of LEDs into the newly printed parts of the cube. Every time I paused the print to move some LEDs around, the bed would move, which would put the print out of alignment. Thankfully, I discovered pretty early on that I could rehome the axes while the print was paused. That came in very useful in reducing the amount of layer shifts. But eventually, as the print became heavier and ultimately came off the bed, any touching of the print would cause more layer shifts, which is why the top of the print looks so rough. Speaking of coming off the bed, you might be wondering how a print that's so large managed to do just that. Well, there are a couple things that happened that aided in the print coming off the bed, and one and a half of them are my fault. Okay, both of them are my fault. And yes, this is where my most questionable decision comes into play, but it's also where I had one of my best saves of this project. Now, the first thing that happened was that the printer threw a thermal runaway error. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically the printer screaming at the top of its lungs that it can no longer read or manage its temperatures. And when it does that, it stops heating the hot end, where the filament comes out, and the bed on which the print was sitting. And it's at that point that I've got no choice but to power cycle the printer and basically kill the entire print progress. 
Thankfully, I caught the error shortly after it happened, and the bed had not yet cooled all the way, so the print was still pretty well adhered. I was able to get the bed heated up again pretty quickly, but I did have to take the build plate off of the bed so that I could rehome the X, Y, and Z axes in an attempt to save the print. Then, I had to edit the G-code file to start a new print at the same layer that the cube was at when the print got its thermal runaway error. Because of the error, I had to reset my printer and it no longer knew how much of the cube had been printed. Anyone who's familiar with the error might be wondering how it's my fault that it happened. Well, the reason is because I had just installed some new LEDs into the cube, but I didn't push them down deeply enough. And so the hot end came around and nicked the electronics and then continued to drag them across the top of the cube, which in turn ripped the protective silicone sock off of the hot end, which then subjected the hot end to the full force of the printer's blower fan. You see, the printer was simultaneously trying to keep the hot end at 200 degrees Celsius while it was also being blown on by the blower fan. The second thing that played a hand in the print coming off the bed came from a sketchy decision that I made that I don't recommend anyone do, but I left the printer paused and running unattended for 10 days. Anyway, I lowered the build plate temperature to a range that I knew wasn't great for bed adhesion to mitigate the risk of the print being left unattended. And yeah, you know, I'm just not going to do that anymore. The print had fallen off the bed in the final few hours of printing, so I basically had to watch those final few hours and push the print back into place whenever it moved, which is why the top looks so rough. I wish I could tell you that this was the end of the cube's problems, but it's not. After the print had finished, I removed the supports and started to work on getting the cube to actually rotate. One of the more egregious layer shifts was at the core of the print, and I tried to be careful, but I ripped the print in half like... I don't know, something you rip in half right down the middle. At this point, admittedly, I was devastated. I had already gotten the wind knocked out of my sails when I had to choose between leaving the print pause for an extreme amount of time or just giving up when it was three quarters of the way done. But now the print wasn't even in one full piece. However, with every problem comes a solution, and with every executed solution, you get valuable experience points. So I got out an old soldering iron and fixed the shift at the core of the print by tearing off the shifted layers in one section, realigning it, and then welding it into place. Then I moved on to the top and, in similar fashion, just kind of melted all of the layers together and used some scraps of support materials to fill in any gaps. And I didn't address every layer shift, I really just fixed it enough so that the top wouldn't flake off. Then it was time to test the lights, batteries, and glow-in-the-dark ability of the cube. Miraculously, the remaining seven wireless receivers still worked and the cube could light up. The LEDs weren't perfectly spaced out in the gears, but I didn't care about that. I knew from the get-go that getting perfectly even light coverage was a tall order. Unfortunately, most of the batteries don't seem to hold a charge, and I'm not entirely sure why. It could be that the charge circuit isn't doing what it claims to do, but I'm very gently blaming the wireless charge setup in general, because the one cube that needs to be plugged in actually lasts for about five minutes on a full charge, which is what I experienced in testing prior to embedding the LEDs in the cube. That's right, I did testing. This was not just some fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants project. The cube looks awesome when it's lit up, and not half bad when it glows in the dark. Despite its shortcomings and the fact that this was a very long project, I am happy that I completed the giant, rotating, glow-in-the-dark LED gear cube. As I mentioned earlier, I try to take every problem and learn from the experience so that I can increase my skill set. If you have any questions about the cube, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Also, I would really appreciate your comments on the format of this video. This is my first longer video, and I'd like to make some more, but I want to make sure that they're worth watching. Was it too fast? Too slow? Did I give you enough information, or do you feel like something was lacking? Please let me know. And if you haven't already, do the whole like and subscribe thing, because if you made it this far in the video, you're probably going to like the next one that I do. Thanks for watching.